Welcome to the QC Pod. I'm Han Mei Cho from Queens College. Today we meet John Dennehy. He is a biology professor at Queens College. Hi, John. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. It's a pleasure to have you here. All right. So today we're going to be talking about the coronavirus and what people should expect heading into 2021. Uh, I just want to first begin by asking, what is the coronavirus? Well, the coronavirus is a single-stranded RNA virus that infects many species of mammals, including humans. What a lot of people don't know is that we have at least four coronaviruses circulating among human population prior to this particular one that's causing us so much problems Mm -hmm. right now. These prior coronaviruses, otherwise known as the common cold, which is a catch-all name for, you know, hundreds of different viruses, including also coronaviruses. This SARS coronavirus that we're experiencing is a much more form of the common cold virus that we're used to. So um, one thing I want to ask is, um, why is this virus spreading so quickly compared to like other viruses we have seen? Well, the main reason is that it's airborne, and much like influenza or the common cold virus, anything that's spread by air doesn't rely on direct contact between humans. So you don't need to physically touch another human in order to get the virus. You can be in the same room as someone else, and breathing that same air, you're able to get infected by the virus. So that's probably the main reason why SARS coronavirus is spreading much more quickly than other viruses that may be transmitted by different means, such as by mosquito bites or by direct contact with a, another person, and so on and so forth. And compared to like other viruses we have seen, like the Ebola virus, is this virus like more deadly? Well, definitely not as lethal as the Ebola virus. So the Ebola virus can kill up to 20 to 50% of people who get infected by it. As far as we know, the number of people dying of coronavirus is about 1% thereabout. So definitely not comparable in terms of mortality rate. One thing about the Ebola virus, however, is you would need to come in contact with the body fluids of a sick patient. So for Ebola virus, patients infect you for only a small, limited amount of time, several days, and sadly, they tend to die very quickly. So it's a very limited time where you can actually be exposed to the virus. In addition, with Ebola virus, it is so virulent that it renders the patient bedridden, unlike SARS coronavirus, where a lot of people who are infected and can't spread the virus are actually feeling no symptoms or very mild symptoms so that they're able to interact with the public and spread the virus by being in the same room with other people. So there's a lot of differences between the biology of coronavirus and the biology of Ebola virus. Now, although if you were to catch Ebola virus, it's much more deadly, but the problem is it can't transmit at the same rate as coronavirus. So even though coronavirus only kills a very small number of the people who become affected, it's so easy to transmit it that ultimately more people, many millions more people are being infected by coronavirus, and consequently, many more people are dying. All right, thank you. Um, Now, this is a concern that's going around in New York, and in that the number of cases are increasing more and more. What is the reason for this? Well, I think, number one, it depends on the season. So we know for a fact that viruses, especially coronaviruses, don't spread as well during the hot summer months. And that's why we have what we call the cold and flu season, which is typically December, January, February. We experienced our worst outbreak last April and March. I think, you know, that was a wake-up call to a lot of people. And people started taking the virus much more seriously and would wear masks and to social distance and to change their behavior to avoid getting ill. So fortunately, we were able to crush the curve. You know, April into May and June, we saw a tremendous drop in the number of cases. And that coincided with the summer months, which traditionally are more difficult for the virus to spread. However, if we move into the fall, 
we're starting to see an increase in the number of cases. And I think there's probably a, a couple of factors that work here. Number one, it's getting easier to spread the virus. The environmental conditions are getting cooler and drier. And number two, people are starting to get coronavirus fatigue. They're tired of social distancing. They're tired of wearing masks. And we see that many more people are stopping to protect themselves, thinking that the worst is over with, and that can't be further from the truth. I totally expect that we'll continue to see an increase in the number of cases in New York City as we move into the winter. Speaking of the coronavirus fatigue, I want to ask, I've seen a lot of people who are not scared of this virus, right? Um, they're not wearing any masks. They're not taking any precautions. What advice would you give to these people? I really don't know what to think. And if anyone thinks that a virus that killed 250,000 people in this country alone is nothing to be afraid of, I don't know what to tell you. It's mind-boggling to me that someone wouldn't take you know, easy, basic precaution to protect themselves from getting infected by something that is clearly killing thousands of our colleagues and peers and family and friends. And not only are you protecting yourself, but by preventing yourself from getting illness, you also protect those that you love and your family around you. The idea that someone is getting tired of wearing a mask but is not going to wear it anymore just doesn't make any sense to me. And a follow-up question to that, I guess, would be, is this virus, the coronavirus, more deadly for people with medical conditions? Uh, and certainly, that's definitely the case, is that we notice there's a lot of what we call comorbidities. So people who have heart issues or kidney issues or diabetes or even a, just aging, they tend to see more severe illness and are more likely to die from SARS coronavirus. And I mean, a lot goes into it, but generally speaking, if you already have a, a damaged heart, for example, you're not as resilient to additional stress as would a much younger person who doesn't have heart issues. So that's part of the reason why people with comorbidities are dying at higher rates, that they're less resilient to surviving a, a really deadly and damaging infection. So it's basically every single little health condition that can really be the determinant factor. Is that correct? Yeah. So like I said, if you have a weak heart, you know, any additional damage caused by SARS coronavirus, and we know that SARS coronavirus is not only attacking the lungs, but is systematically infecting almost every major organ system of the body, including your brain, your heart, your liver, your kidneys, your gut. If any of these organs are weak, they're not going to be able to handle the much higher stresses posed by virus infection. And in addition, many of these people have weakened immune system, which makes it more difficult to defend against the virus. All right. Um, I want to talk about vaccines next. And this is a question that I'm really personally interested in. And the question is, why are the vaccines taking so long to develop? I mean, we have like the greatest minds across the world, but why is it taking so long for it to develop? Well, honestly, I respond to that by saying it's actually not taking very long at all. And historically, it's taken 10 to 15 years to develop most vaccines. And in fact, the fastest development on record, I believe, was about four years. So going from a standing start last winter, January, about the mid of January last year, which when most of the world kind of broke up to the reality of coronavirus, we have already three vaccines that have been shown to be at least 62% effective of, or more. The two vaccines that have been shown to be greater than 90% effective. So it, it's actually the development of these vaccines has happened in record time. And the reason I believe it takes so long is not so much that it's difficult to find vaccines that are effective, but rather to undergo rigorous safety testing. So in order to see if this vaccine is, is safe, first they will inoculate laboratory animals and see if there's a negative reaction. If that's not the case, then they will try it on a small number of humans mm. to look for adverse reaction. And if that doesn't happen, 
Then they move on to what we call phase three trial. In the case of the Moderna vaccine was tested on 30,000 adults. So the way that we do this effectiveness testing is we're going to give the vaccine to 30,000 adults. Now that's going to take some time, right? And then you need to wait a certain amount of time for some of those people to be exposed to the virus. So many of the people targeted were healthcare workers. If we can look at the data after a couple of months and we see that the people receiving the vaccine were less likely to be infected by SARS coronavirus than would a control group who did not receive the vaccine, then we have some indication that the vaccine is effective. But all of that's going to take some time to do, right? Right. So what we're seeing is uh, is actually the fastest developed vaccine in history. So I guess um, the next question is, with this vaccine that's in development, people have been saying that you should wait to take the vaccine instead of being a guinea pig and going first. Can you explain if this is a good idea and what potential side effects of this vaccine might be? Right. So by the time the vaccine is approved, it's usually been tested on thousands and thousands of people. So it's usually the case that any significant adverse events would have been discovered by that point. If the FDA approved the vet of the vaccine, I would feel comfortable taking that vaccine without any waiting period, especially with these mRNA vaccines. The way that the mRNA vaccine produced by Pfizer or Moderna is an mRNA particle that, when expressed, is going to make a component of the virus. mRNA is taken up by cells, and using the cell translation machinery, the cell will start making particles of the virus. This, I think, much safer than using a attenuated vaccine, whole virus vaccine, or any of the other strategies that have been used to produce vaccines. So I would feel very comfortable taking one of these mRNA vaccines. Anytime you're using a drug, I don't care what drug it is, there's always going to be some people who have adverse reactions to it. There can be patients who experience mild side effects or even some that will experience major side effects. Vaccines are no different. Anytime you're going to take a foreign substance put it into the human body, you're going to have a wide range of responses, which always, not always can be predicted. So I have no doubt that we will see some cases where people will have an adverse reaction, but we have to consider the cost and benefits. In the long run, we will save many, many more lives if we treat everyone with the SARS coronavirus vaccine quickly than if we were to drag out the safety rebuttal process for many, many more months. Um, so the question I want to ask next is, there have been discussions that the coronavirus will be an endemic like the flu. Can you explain what this means? Well, so essentially what they mean is that the virus is not ever going away. And I think that's the case. We have a couple of cold viruses that we know that are sticking with us for many, many generations. Also, the influenza virus. Every year, we have to get a new influenza virus vaccine for the currently circulating strains. What a lot of people don't know is that the 1918 influenza pandemic that killed millions of people back in the 1918 era, that influenza virus is still with us today and currently circulates among people. It never went away. It did, however evolve and change in a way that made it much less lethal to humans than did that 1918 version. So I predict that the same thing is going to happen for SARS coronavirus. It's not going to go away, but it's likely we will see a much more attenuated version of that virus persist in human population for some years to come. All right, and to conclude my series of questioning, um, I just wanted to ask, when can we expect things to go back to normal? Or it's probably, as you said, it's probably never going to go back to normal, but when can we start to see some positive changes? Well, I, I do think that we will go back to normal at some point. Normal might be a little bit different than what we see now. As far as the timeline goes, 
I think we're going into the winter season and we're going into the holiday season. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. And we still do not have access to the vaccine yet. Once the vaccine starts rolling out, once we start moving into the spring, you know, by that point, a significant number of people will have been infected and recovered and will be moving closer to what we call herd immunity. Eventually, by late spring, I think the worst of it will be behind us. Certainly by next summer and next fall, I think we'll be moving into the new normal. What does that new normal look like? I don't think we'll be wearing masks. I think at that point, we'll be able to put aside our mask and we can gather normally with our family and friends, but there'll be long, I hope, long-standing changes in, in the way we do business. For one thing, I think that this work from home will be more of a persist. In other words, I think work from home will stick around from now on. And uh, also, I think that I would hope we will do more to prevent the next pandemic. We drastically need to improve our ability to respond quickly to a new virus pandemic, which we have no doubt will appear sometime down the road. One of the most distressing things for me about the present pandemic was all the supply shortages, shortages with testing, shortages with personal protective equipment. We are just generally unprepared for the virus when practically most virologists knew that it was coming. So it's up to us to make clear to politicians that, you know, this isn't a one-off event. We're going to see another pandemic another time in our lifetime. We need to be better prepared next time. I just want to talk briefly about the supply shortages, if that's okay. And sure. uh, I just wanted to ask, why are there shortage of supplies? I have no idea. This is sort of something outside my experience as a scientist, but you would think that the demand for supplies is obvious. Someone would jump into the picture and be, you know, begin to manufacture supplies to meet that demand. You know, even now in the fall, it's more difficult for me to buy rubber gloves for the lab than it was last spring, paradoxically. Many, many items that we use in our coronavirus research are very hard to obtain. I just don't quite understand what's going on in the manufacturing aspect. I've heard that there are shortages of the raw material. I've heard that there are bottlenecks in the manufacturing process. There's only so many machines available to make certain, you know, gloves, for example. But, you know, the economics of that I, I really don't quite understand what's going on. All right, John, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Sure, no problem. You've been listening to the QC Pod. Special thank you to John Dennehy from Queens College. The QC Pod is a production of Queens Podcast Lab. To learn more, visit queenspodcastlab.org. I'm Han Macho. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>